Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is our own pianist in residence, Sam Page. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Indeed we are. And uh, Sam, oh, we're getting a little bit of loop. Where'd the loop come from? Oh, now the loop's gone away. Good. Okay. I was hearing an echo, like, wait a minute, what's going on? I just said that five seconds ago. <laughs> no, I guess, well, they do, yeah, but it takes a while sometimes for the, the filtering to kick in, but I guess the filtering is here. So, Sam, what I was going to ask you before the filtering so rudely interrupted me, uh, we, we haven't uh, touched base about uh, the piano lately and, and your music, but you released your album, what was it, about a month ago, something like that? month and a half or so, month yeah. I'm, I'm just curious to know what kind of reception you've had so far. So far, so good. As far as I've heard, I haven't heard like a ton of feedback, but the feedback I have got has been very nice. So I appreciate that. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, Corby, uh, Sam is one of those pianists who he doesn't actually compose. He just sits down and stuff starts coming out of his fingers. And he did an entire oh, he, album. He channels. He channels pretty much. He channels music. Like my, yeah. I just figured that out about a year ago, probably, but that's kind of my form of channeling, if you it will. It is. It is. Yeah. And you do it beautifully. And the oh, stuff that comes out is, oh, it makes you, your spine tingle. It's such good stuff. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. And our it. guest today, of course, uh, her name is Corby Mitleid. And Corby is, well, she's a tarot master. Um, she specializes in past life. Um, she's a psychic medium. And and she's a teacher and an author. And uh, it's been a while since we've had somebody on the show who, who does that specific uh, territory, so to speak. Obviously, we, we've had uh, channelers on. Um, quite a bit in the last year or so, but uh, someone who, who does tarot or psychic medium stuff or past life regression, not regression, but past life. Um, uh, retrieval. Retrieval. There's uh -oh. the word. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so we haven't had that in a while. So this is going to be interesting. So Corby, thank you for joining us on the pro program today. How are you doing? Wonderful. It's a pleasure to be here. And yay, Halloween is over. I'm sorry. I don't do snakes, <laughs> bats, and spiders. November and December, they're my months. Got it. Okay, fair enough. And uh, give us like a little bit of a, you know, two minute biography, so to speak of, you know, how you got to where you are today. That's what I call the 32nd elevator speech. Okay. When I was nine, I read a book called The Witch Family by Eleanor Estes. And I thought, cool, there's magic in the world. I want to go find it. <laughs> Fast forward to 1973, when I was a senior in high school. And yes, my darlings, that tells you how old I am. I was working <laughs> part time at Spencer Gifts. That was the year Live and Let Die came out. They had the James Bond 007 tarot deck, and I bought it because we were all hippies then. You had your elephant bell bottoms, your fringe jacket, and your deck. Wow. Yeah, Five there's, years there's later. Some, there, there's some uh, flashbacks right there just in what you described. Yes. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Five years later, everyone else had moved on to roller skates and disco balls, but I was still fascinated by the cards. So for 20 years, I read for friends, keeping my ego on the shelf and making sure I was a clear channel for the information that came through all of a sudden in the early 90s i could do hands-on healing and talk to dead people with no training that's when the universe was handing me my draft notice and saying hello you're working for us <laughs> so i did it part-time till 9 11 doing lots of other things when we watched the towers burn i turned to my husband and i said i need to do this work full-time people need to know there are other answers out there he said i believe in you go do it so 20 years I work six days a week. I read about a thousand people a year and wow. I get to get up in the morning. I don't have to get up in the morning. And that's the biggest gift. That is always a big gift. I love that. Yeah. Because that means that you're excited. You're happy. You're enjoying what you do. You mm -hmm. can't wait for the next day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Life's, like, life's so much better with that perspective. So I love isn't that. It? <laughs> yeah. It is best. So that sounds like, well, that's a pretty happy story. I have to say. I like it. Yes. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean Life hasn't been easy, but when you do this work, you learn how to live the examined life. You learn how to ask yourself the right questions mm. so that instead of having a pity party, it's always, okay, what can I learn from this? For me, how can I teach with it? And next. Talk about some of those questions that you, that you asked yourself and that is the, are the kinds of questions that people need to sure. ask. All right. Um, you know, you're going to have about 15 seconds of not happy. I have been through divorce, rape, abuse, poverty, cancer three times. But this is part of my pre-birth plan in order to learn what I need to learn. When I got cancer, I was only married for 18 months. 
And it was a second primary, danger clock back to zero, but the docs in Massachusetts said, well, three strikes are out. We're taking the rack, we're taking the ovaries, and you're going from this Dolly Parton figure to a fat fire plug with permanent side effects in three weeks, suck it up. Mm. Now, did I go home and cry for 24 hours? Christ, yes, I'm normal. But then I said, I need to find three reasons to be okay with this. First one was, you don't have them, you can't get cancer there. Number two, the top half was not going to get slammed in the refrigerator door at the doctor's every year. And every woman listening knows exactly what I'm talking about. Three, implants, I'll be perky till I'm 93. That's cool. So I walked out (laughs) of Mass General after a double mastectomy and reconstruction in three days, shopped for a bathing suit in five. That was in 2004. This is 2022, 67 years old, clean, and still married. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary. So... When you don't have the pity party, when you don't look at it as, you know, what did I do wrong? Then you have the ability to move through it and heal. And the questions you always need to ask yourself are this. Number one, what am I ex about? X is depressed or sad or scared or mad or whatever. Why am I ex about that? And the one question we never ask ourselves, what do I think would happen if I stopped being X about that? Give yourself the opportunity to choose differently. I love that. Sort of a a variation on the Byron Katie four questions, but a little more direct in the way that you do it. These, and I learned these at the Option Institute, which was around for like 40 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, Good place. So I use that. A lot of my clients, it's like dawn breaks over Marblehead when they realize they're allowed to change. They don't have to, you know, wallow in being a victim victim doesn't do anything for you this is true although we as human beings often spend a lot of time in that place but you're right it really doesn't do much for us other than perhaps to help us know what it is we don't want and and to identify what we want instead but yes but we've been tricked we watch the oh poor me victims on reality shows Mm -hmm. and they win these you know million dollar houses well you know what that's like winning the lottery it, what is it right now? It's over a billion. So you, it's one in 278 million that you're going to win. Mm-hmm. You really mm-hmm. want to count on that? I don't think so. Better you <laughs> fix it yourself. That's very good. I enjoy that. And then also, uh, you, you said you taught, you start off doing tarot and you, you mm-hmm. maintain doing that. You've continued. Is that like your, your primary thing that you enjoy doing? Well, it's one of a couple. Um, and it's not just tarot. I use one tarot deck. But I also use Ooh. eight other oracle decks, which have a different flavor. Each one. Mm-hmm. They are gorgeous. Um, what I tell people is, number one, I'm not special. You can do what I do. But when you accept your draft notice from the universe, it goes rifling through your file cabinet to see what you got. What's in mine? Theater major at Brown, actress in New York in the late 80s and in early 90s. So mm-hmm. I know character arcs. Words are my drug of choice. I'm a writer, so I know how to tell a story. And I have been a history freak since I was a little kid in single digits. You put all that together, and my two main abilities are telling the stories of the cards and past life retrieval. Okay. Don't ask me to do spirit art. Can't draw a sharp with a sharp pencil a lot of prayer. It's not that <laughs> Well, you do it every day for a year, you might be able to, but it, it doesn't sound like it's an interest. It's something. Why you waste my do. time? I have more fun with these things, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And, I mean, besides these card uh, makers today, like Sam was commenting, make gorgeous cards anyway. Why would you need to? They're doing all the beautiful artwork. So, That's true. They really are. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are just absolutely stunning, the, the imaginations that these artists have. So, and okay, so you started, and, and after 9-11, you, you talked about how you wanted to do this full-time. Was this the tarot, or was it a broader spectrum, or, or what was it? This was psychic work. Psychic work. At that, okay. Psychic work. At that point, my strong points were the cards. But more and more, I started being able to really get the past life information down. And it really started when I uh, was introduced to Robert Schwartz, and he tapped me as one of the four major channels in his book series, on pre-birth planning and life oh. between lives. Now, because I love history, there are other people who are really good at pulling down past lives. But if you show both of us the same vision and they don't have my background, they're going to say to you, well, I see you in a long skirt and a big hat with a feather and it's in front of something really fancy. Maybe it's Europe or something, but it's old fashioned. 
I would see the exact same vision and say, okay, she's in a hobble skirt, a picture hat, that kind of ostrich feather, and she's standing in front of the Brandenburg Gate. We're talking about Berlin in 1911 or 12. Which one's going to give you more information? Sure. Yeah, you got more context that way. Exactly so. Yeah, that's excellent. That's really, really good. Uh, you also made reference to, I think you called it your pre-birth plan. That's a topic we haven't addressed it a lot in the last year or so, but for mm -hmm. about a year, a year and a half, it came up a lot. And mm -hmm. the, the the big controversy around it is, that, and, and I have to admit, I'm kind of on the fence about it. Um, the big controversy is, well, do you believe, does one believe that they're, they they pre plan their lives that, that you know they intended to go through all this this stuff that they went through or the way I like okay. to phrase it is what on earth was I thinking that's the way I like to think about it. <laughs> so the thing is you weren't thinking apparently um, <laughs> because we're just the construct the way I'm gonna there like two or three parts let's take the actor Matt Smith Matt was the eleventh Doctor in Doctor Who he was my doctor the crazy best friend with a bow tie and the two short pants. When he was done with that, he hung that outfit up and he became Prince Philip in the first two seasons of The Crown. Totally different person. When he was done with that, he hung up the prince's costume and now he's playing some nut job in House of the Dragon. <laughs> yeah. Think of Matt Smith as our soul, our higher self, and each of the parts he played is an incarnation. This is why when people look at me and says, well, the Bible says that we only live once, I go, you're exactly right. Because it's our soul that comes down time and again. Walt, Corby, Sam, we are one and done. Now, what about pre-birth planning versus free will? Look at college. You go in and you decide you're going to be a physics major. That's your pre-birth plan. But you can either go through college taking gut courses or double major plus lab. You'll still graduate with your degree. That's our free will. So. When our soul says, this is what I want, this is what I want to learn, it sets up these touch points. Because karma is not bad and good, carrot and stick. Karma is five things. Healing, service, contrast, unbalanced energy, and healing of beliefs. Okay? Let's take Ryan White. Remember, he was the kid in the late 80s and early 90s who got AIDS from a blood transfusion before we knew anything about it. And he was treated like a pariah and hounded where he lived. It was awful. But his family still was strong. He still had a good attitude. So he met Elton John. And Elton at that point was drink, drinking and drugging him, his way into an early death. But he really became close to Ryan and his family. Played at Ryan's funeral when Ryan died. Was inspired by Ryan to get off the booze and the drugs and everything else. And created the Elton John AIDS Foundation, which has raised more than half a billion dollars for HIV and AIDS research worldwide. Now, old way of thinking, they would look at Ryan White and say, oh, he was terrible. Look what God did to him. What bad karma. New think is the higher self looked and said, well, it's going to be a short life and a tough one. But look at what I can do for the world as a result. So his karma is not bad or good. His karma is service. See how that changes the entire aspect? If I had not gone through everything that I went through, I would not be the teacher I am today. I would not be as compassionate as I am today. I would not look at myself as a whole person instead of just this girl with a Dolly Parton figure who was only worth her looks. So if you see how what we go through is like a refining fire. You stay out of the pity party. Look, if I was a size two blonde with a trust fund that never had a problem in her life, do you think people with horrible life situations would trust me not to judge them? Mm -mm. Probably not. But when I say been there, done that, you can't upset me. Talk to me. Their shielding drops and I can help them. This is very, very interesting. It's an interesting take on, like I said, a topic we've talked about a lot. And you, what were the five? You, you went through them pr pretty quickly, and I didn't write them down. What are the five? These are all the what Rob Schwartz found in his books. Oh, okay. Your soul's plan, your soul's gift, and your soul's love. They are healing, service, contrast, unbalanced energy, which is a neutral, 
and healing of beliefs. And, and just give us like a little quick one liner on each one of those. All right. Healing is there was an example of someone that Rob talked with, I believe, in the first book, who in one life heard her mother shot dead by the boyfriend in the next room. And it was so traumatic that the soul said, in order to heal this, I'm going to bring in an incarnation that's deaf. So it will never have to hear anything like that. So that healed, healed that trauma. And Service, keep going. I, I have to let a cat in, but keep going. I'll be with you in just a second. <laughs> I understand from cats. Okay. <laughs> Service, we just talked about Ryan White. Contrast. If you want to learn about abundance, you have to have one life as a one percenter and one life, you know, selling, uh, you know, trinkets in Calcutta so that you see what it's like on both sides. Okay. Unbalanced energy. Let's say that in one life, you come in and you are in a wheelchair all your life and your parents give up everything to take care of you. You might in the next life have your parents come in as your twin boys who each have a disability and you're with them all of your life. So that's unbalanced energy. Healing of beliefs in one life, you, well, look at now. Um, you were a Nazi in World War II. This life you come in as a Jew. That's how it works. It's not bad or good. It's what can you learn and bring back to the soul. Oh, not hearing oh, you, Walt. Okay. You're muted. <laughs> it helps if I unmute. It's funny how it <laughs> works. Yes, it does. Yes, no, I unmuted myself so that I could uh, go get the cat, but I've got the cat. Um, no, what I was saying is I, I love that last bit especially because – you're right. I mean, we, we humans do have this very, very strong tendency to think about things as being good or bad. We're taught yes. that by our society. I mean, our, our society is we structured are. in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's a great reminder that we don't really have to adopt that viewpoint if we don't want to. Mm -hmm. we, we can yeah. actually shift that. And it can mm -hmm. take some doing. I mean, sometimes you have to go down that spiral and get into that really bad place before you're willing to do it. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. it's going to take some doing sometimes. But nevertheless, it still becomes worthwhile. Because what yes. we're really doing is we're, we're letting go of stuff that we kind of, it was kind of attached to us when we came into the world. And now we're saying, well, I don't necessarily really want to live that way. I don't want to think that way. I don't want to How many people that. are born into a family who is very rigid in one way of thinking? Mm -hmm. And they go, I mean, my family, everybody was medical. Dad was a cardiologist. Mom was an RN. My brother is pulmonology and had a chair named after him at Boston Children's. Wow. Me? I'm a writer. I'm an actress. I could have danced on the table and recited Shakespeare and they wouldn't have got me. But that's <laughs> all right because what that did is it propelled me out into the world to find who I was not working within their parameters. And that's when I got my gifts. Not only the wiki woo, but the deeper, compassionate, emotional understanding. Another aspect of, of what you're just describing right there that I always find to be fascinating is what the familial reactions are to those kinds of things. Because it, it, sometimes it's just one person. Sometimes it's more than one person in a family who kind of break the mold. And now it's up to the rest of the family to decide how are we going to respond to that. And it's going to be a different reaction every single time. You know, some people are just going to, they're going to resist it. Like, oh, well, that's the black sheep of the family, all that kind of stuff. Other people embrace mm -hmm. it. it. It's it's kind of a wide range of of possible reactions. Um, but from the perspective, of, from the soul perspective, can, can you describe what, maybe not what, can you, can you talk a little bit about how the family members who are involved with that particular soul are are influenced by that soul's decision? They come in with whatever their karmic lessons are, and it's just another factor. Uh, there are some people in my family that think I'm a charlatan who steals people's money. There are some people in my family who are a little amazed at what I can do. Mm -hmm. And there's one person in my family, my fabulous beloved nephew, who believes in his aunt 2,000%. Oh, that's great. Aww, I love that. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. That's good. 
Yeah, he uh, asked me when he was a kid, are we our souls or are our souls bigger than us? And I looked at him and I said, my darling boy, I'm not allowed to discuss this stuff until you're 18. But after that, <laughs> and now he's 38. And so we've talked about it for 20 years. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's really cool, though. Cool. That, that's that. I mean, he clearly had some insight of his own going on to ask a question like that. For sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Let's talk about that for a minute. Insight. That's that's mm-hmm. plays obviously it plays a large role in what you do. As you pointed out earlier, we all have these abilities. The questions yes. are really about which ones of us are willing to develop them, which ones are interested, all that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. let's talk talk specifically about insight and how you. I mean, you became aware, self-aware of your own fairly mm-hmm. early on. Others of us, like myself, were, were like clueless, had no idea anything like that was going on. And again, mm-hmm. there's a wide range that goes on there. But talk about insight from your perspective. Well, when you say insight, I want you to define it for me, how you see insight. And then I will explain it from that point of view, because the word can mean a million different things. No doubt. And I'm going to kind of punt here because I have to honestly say, I don't have a clear, clear way of describing it. I can tell you to a limited degree how I so far see it and understand it. Um, It Mm -hmm. took me a while to even recognize that this was going on inside of me. Um, But the way I think about it is it's as if there is a piece, uh, not a piece, but a place, if you will, inside of me in a particular location that I didn't pay any attention to for years because it's constant. And okay. it never what you're talking anything. about is intuition. Insight okay. is more emotionally built. Okay. When you've seen so many of your buddies growing up in dysfunctional families, you get an insight of how to make a better marriage. But intuition, we have to get out of our own way. Mm. But I tell people, you need to keep notes. When you're starting, you, you know, have a piece of your computer or on your tablet or whatever, where when you get a hit on something, you write it down and you write down your reaction and you see yes or no. Um, you also get out of your own way. You know, when I do readings, I cannot judge what I'm saying, what's coming out of my mouth, because then my ego gets in the way. Should I tell them that? That's not right. Um, One of the stories I will tell, and I'll tell you the PG version. One of the reasons I don't do mediumship on the air or in a big gallery setting is because I do it a little differently than most people. I don't just fish. I see a woman in a flower dress handing you a rose. It's your grandmother. Oh, please. (laughs) Um, I get their dog tags. Their name, who they were to you, the year they died, and how old they were. Okay? Example. My father, Jerome Richard Dorkin, who died in 2001 at the age of 80, says nothing but gets me into the energy. And I don't censor what I get. So there was a biracial, same gender couple. The black partner had died and her white widow wanted to speak to her. Now, for everybody who is not looking at this picture, this is a nice, you know, little Jewish kid from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I have manners. What came rolling out of my mouth in flawless urban ebonics, I am not going to say, because it should not come out of this face. But it did, and my eyes got very wide, and I turned a little green, but the person in front of me was laughing and nodding, because that particular two-sentence phrase is how her partner walked into the house after every business trip. But it should not have been done on in a public space. Hmm. On the other hand, Because of this past life gift I've got, I've done past life galleries where people just hand me an obsession, a phobia, a place, a person, and I immediately can get um, where the connection is. Uh, Two quick examples. There was a woman who said, my son is 29. He still won't make any decisions without me. He won't live more than a mile from me. What's going on? And I went, okay. 1944, Utah Beach. So this is D-Day. Seeing your boy, he's on the beach. He's been wounded. He has a lot of shrapnel in the leg. You're his commanding officer. You are reaching over a dune. You pull him over. You take some shrapnel too, but you both get out of there and you both live. And I opened my eyes and she goes, can you see my rank? I said, oh yeah, you were a sergeant. She goes, he's called me Sarge since he was three years old and we've never known why. Number two, a woman says, 
Why have I always been fascinated by the Civil War? It really moves me. And, you know, she's corn fed from Iowa. She has no connection. And I say, okay. I'm seeing a whitewashed room with a low ceiling. There are two tall gentlemen. Their heads are bent over because they're almost too tall for the room. You are kneeling by the bed. The dress looks like it's about 1862 or three. Uh, it's gray. There's black soutache trim around the peplum, the sleeves and the hem. It, there's a rickety iron bed. There's a little old black woman in it and she's dying and you're all very upset. Because you had pulled her from a Mississippi plantation, you had almost gotten her to the end of the Underground Railroad, but she was going to die and not make it. And I opened my eyes, and this woman is sobbing. She says, I have had that dream for 20 years, exactly, and I've never known what it was. Wow. That's my gift, much more important for me than mediumship in the, in the public eye. Well, I can see why, because with that level of detail... You're clearly it. hitting it right on the nose. I mean, they, they, mm -hmm. it's not a question of, gee, was that really a mess? No, yeah, I get that exactly. That's exactly what happened to me. It, it just resonates. But don't, don't come to me and say I must have been Anne Boleyn because I can't wear turtleneck. I'm going to go out the exit <laughs> store. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I've only gotten three maybe famous-ish people in my life. Um, Jen Weigel turned out to be Nellie Bly the famous female reporter. Um, one of my Canadian clients was Jacob Rees. Uh, she was a great photographer, loved black and white, but knew nothing about him. Jacob Rees is the famous person who took the black and white pictures of the tenements in turn of the 20th century New York City. Right. And there was one girl who was Mercy Otis Warren, who was the best friend of Abigail Adams. You know, these are not really people that most people would know. But the resonance was so strong and everything I got and told them this, they turned a little pale, but they kept nodding because it made complete and utter sense to them. It's always been kind of a, um, a, a, a ha ha for me, a, a funny bone tickler that you know mm -hmm. people will, will tell stories about, you know, they had the psychic reading or whatever and, oh, they found out they're related to some oh. famous person or they're descended. You know, and I, I'm, I, I don't remember which comedian it was, but one of the comedians said, I mean, what, what are there anybody out there who was descended from Joe Blow? <laughs> That's mostly what I get. And I prefer it that way because then you're not concentrating on who you were so much as what the life told you. Mm. You know, if you are um, a janitor in St. Louis and you find out you're Napoleon, are you going to be satisfied being a janitor? No, you're going to waste your life wishing you could be who you were. Mm. Past lives are only meant to help us be better at who we are in this life. That's why we don't remember them. So Give we us an example of that. Best. What you just said, that the idea that they're, they're meant to help us in this life. Well, um, I just gave you two. There was a woman, one woman that I worked with who um, was born into a Jewish family and never felt right about it. We were able to go back and find a hundred years ago, there was a life where she was a, good German and noble, not nobleman, but a noble person and good and a great teacher and all of that, but anti-Semitic as hell. Uh -huh. So her soul decided, let's do that healing of beliefs and you're going to come in as a Jew. And once she understood what that was about, the difficulty went away. She realized it was old energy and now she was able to truly explore who she had chosen to be in this life. Very nice. Sam, um, I, I, as usual, you're, you're quiet partly because I talk so much and partly because you're just a quiet human being. But what are you thinking about right now as you're hearing what Corby's talking about? I'm finding this all just very interesting, all these stories and examples. And I'm curious about it for myself almost in a way. But I, I think that's really interesting how like old old iterations of the old old physical manifestations that you've experienced in the past can affect one in its present and everything. But that makes, that makes sense because you manifest into reality to experience and expand and everything. And so you pick up on things and then some are maybe don't completely go away necessarily, or it's interesting how these things connect. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, it's great fun. I love doing these past lives. So, this is reinforcing the idea that we are not only connected to each other in this life, but we're also connected 
through back through the generations. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's a it's a continuous stream no matter what direction you look at. And, you know, people always want to know who's there when I die. Is my aunt Joan going to be there? Well, honey, not only is Aunt Joan going to be there, but all the souls that you had lives with previously, it's like coming off a cruise ship and there's this mad crowd that's waving and, you know, good to see it. Wow. So don't don't think small. You're reminding me of what happened when my father passed. He passed um, 2008, just before the financial crisis hit. Mm-hmm. And when he passed, my, my sister has done a little bit of work to, to develop her psychic abilities. and within a few days after he passed she uh she was with my mom in my mom's church and in the midst of the service all of a sudden she got this massive headache and realized that she was getting a, a contact from him and th- the first thing this is my sister the first thing my sister mm-hmm. uh thought of to put out to him was dad is that you yeah what's it like on the other side and the response that she got back was that it was festive which was <laughs> i thought a really interesting response and mm-hmm. part of the, well, part of the reason why I thought it was interesting is my sister, my, my sister is like you. She has a theater background. The last word she would mm-hmm. choose is festive. You know, she would go, you know, it was amazing. It's dramatic, incredible, you know, all this other kind of stuff. Yep. No, she, she wouldn't call it festive. Um, so that helped reinforce for me that it was genuine. But the other part that, that was fascinating to me that came out of that is my, my dad saying that it fit my dad beautifully to use that, that word. And what comes through with the use of that word is exactly what you just described. There's like all this. This, this crowd of activity going on. That was, that was his impression of, of basically arriving. So it fits perfectly with what you're saying. What I try to get people to understand is I know you want to speak to your dead aunt, aunt Mabel, but please give her 90 days up there to unpack her bag, sign the guest register, get the orientation tour, because we have to be able to shed the personality and get into our full soul self. Some have an easy time of it, some not. Uh, One of the things we have to go through is the life review. And what that is, is we experience all the good things we did for other people, and we feel that. And we also experience all of the negative things that we did for other people, and we feel it as if it was done to us. But when that's done, it's done. That's what hell is, is having to go through those, why did I do that? But then it's done. Um. And when you get a relation and they've relaxed into that, it will be all the best parts of them. For instance, I said my dad was a doctor. He was my best friend. Sometimes when I do medical intuitive work, he'll come in, especially if it's cardiac related. What do we get? Well, he still does terrible puns. His kindness, his compassion, his medical genius and knowledge. What is no longer coming down with him? The hypochondria, the depression, and the anxiety, those were things that were manifested by the personality to learn. He doesn't need them now. So perfect example. I was, this was years ago. I was with a woman who was 74 and still an RN. She said, could you do me a favor? Just do a baseline check. How am I doing? And I sensed the rustle of a white coat behind me and I point to the empty air and I say, I'd like to introduce you to my father, Dr. Jerome Dorkin. He was a really fabulous cardiologist when he was alive and he still does consults. Now remember, I know from nothing about medicine, zip nada. But I open up and what comes out of my mouth is what's with the T waves. She looks at me. Her last electrocardiogram, EKG, had abnormal T waves. What did my father do as director of the heart station at Cooper Hospital in Camden, New Jersey for 30 years? read EKGs. Mm -hmm. So I turn over my shoulder and I laugh and I say, you know, you're still a pretty damn good doctor, even if you are dead. He laughs back. (laughs) So that's an example of what we retain. The more you are in your positive, loving, giving, wise self, the more you're in your own soul. And the less difficulty you will have when you shift over. Hey, um, going back to the uh, life review for a second, you mentioned mm-hmm. that we go through both sides of it that way. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, what I'm curious about is what it is that we're actually doing when we're doing this life review. Is, is there is there a purpose to it, so to speak? Is there a, a way of understanding? We are, what's, we are seeing this? firsthand what our reactions do. We are looking at the thread. I mean, look, I'm 67. I've had a really 
traumatic life. So I don't have lots and lots of years of memories to go back to. I stay pretty much in the now. When I cross over, I'm going to be able to look at all of the things that I know from my life, all the things that currently I've forgotten, and take what lessons I can from them. That's why we do it. Okay. So it's more than just uh, the, taking the character off now that we've moved out of this character's life. Remember that our soul sent us down here with pre-birth plans. What did I learn? When did I learn it? What were some good trip triggers for me? Where did I not get it right for the next one? And the soul absorbs that. So this is all soul driven, our souls yep. driving the yep. whole bus here. Yep. What's the soul's motivation? Learning, love. You know, if I was going to tell you what I think God is, God is this central point of love and compassion way bigger than anything we can possibly, possibly understand with our little pea brains. <laughs> you know, thinking that we can understand God is like walking an ant into a calculus class and sitting him down to work on the equations. The ant's little pea brain cannot hold the information. And in fact, he can't hold a pencil in his little paw. <laughs> so don't bother. You know, we that's what we humans are. We are infinitesimal but it is a way it, we are the pencil that our soul learns with it's mm. another way to think about it so when we talk about self-development we're talking about the soul really developing developing the more, we de the more self development we do the more we're bringing back information to the soul and the more positive compassionate loving we get the more we're in our true soul self. And that's less karma and crud that we're bringing back that we have to deal with. So you've mentioned the word karma a few times. So let's touch mm -hmm. on that a little bit too, just to get, a, you, you called for a definition from me before, so I'm going to call for a definition mm -hmm. from you. Define karma so that we understand clearly what it is. Karma is the lessons we decide to learn. That's why it's not good karma, bad karma. If we come down with the karma of service, and don't ask me karma versus dharma because that's not my wheelhouse. But from what I understood working with Rob, karma is choosing what the lessons are. It is deciding who you're going to learn with. It is deciding how it's going to happen. For instance, um, my mother and father. Dad has always been my best friend. Life after life after life. But we normally come in as same generation. Go, putting all of the stuff down that I was going to have to learn this lifetime, I knew I'd need a father as a best friend. So my soul asked his, would you come in as this soul's father? And he said, yes. My mother, who was an alcoholic cross addicted with barbiturates and very abusive and very unhappy, had lots of karma with my dad. They've been together a long time. It was the first time she was ever with me. And that is a really kind and loving soul. But she agreed to come in with those difficulties in order for her to work out stuff with dad and to give me the strongest lesson at age 16 where I was going to decide, am I the awful person that my mother says I am or not? If I had said, oh, yeah, I'll show her, my life would have been very different. But I believed that I was the monster that she told me I was, which is what set me up for the next 30, 40 years of pure hell. But I learned from being in all of that. So there's no anger toward her. She and I agreed on what was going to happen. It was my choice here that played out. That's all. I doubt very much, though, that you were... I thought from that perspective while you're in the midst of it, that's the perspective. Isn't oh, of, that course you not. Right. of course not. But again, remember I said that my soul put me through all of this so that I could learn women are worth more than their bodies. I'm worth more than what I looked like. That love is not transactional. It's given. And it supported me in becoming the teacher and guide I am now. That's why I can't be angry about it. Do I like who I am now? Hell yeah. 
Well, I needed that recipe. Okay. Maybe next time I'll be able to do it a little more easily. Don't know. Does it matter to you? Whether you'll be able to do it more easily? It won't matter to me. I won't be here. Well, okay. Does, Does it matter, do you think, to your soul, to your next incarnation? Not at all. This is all simply information. You can't get it wrong. You're going to graduate with the degree you needed no matter what you do. So but if a, you do it easy down here, it's easier on you, the personality. It's a, it's a data collection exercise is really what it is. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Rob very often talks about the white room exercise. People say, well, why do we have to go through this, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you're in a white room with white curtains and white furniture and white walls and you're in white clothes, you have no idea what purple is. Mm. You need that contrast. Mm. Um, so that's why we come down and have the duality and the contrast we do here, because there are things that we can learn down here through that duality that we can't learn when we're out of the body. That, that's another topic that has gotten a lot of attention over the last few years, you know, contrast or polarity or duality or however you want to label mm-hmm. it. And uh, the ongoing theme being what can we do to learn to appreciate it and to find value in it rather than saying, oh, my God, what the, blah, 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 blah. Because that's our first reaction, right? To, to that's do the three one. questions. That's the three questions. What am I X about? Why am I X about that? What do I think would happen if I stopped being X about that? And it wasn't until I said, what do I think is going to happen if I stop being upset about the double mastectomy that I found the reasons to be okay with it, zapped up my immune system so I healed as fast as I did and learned to accept who I was going to be without the looks. Questions are not so much signs of doubt as abilities to crystallize what we know. That's very good. I like that particularly. Barry Neal Kaufman, the man that I learned most of this from. That's very good. Yeah. I've, I've been a question asker. Well, I think that's one reason I'm a host, but I've been a question asker all of my life. And for the, for the life of me, I was confused for the longest time about why people seem to have this thing about questions that I didn't have. You, you just you know, verbalized it really, really nicely. Um, but to me, question asking is about data gathering. We were just talking about a lifetime of data gathering. That's what questioning is. Mm-hmm. Questioning is well, about data gathering. That's where I, in, in my book, Clean Out Your Life Closet, I talk about the happy Martian detective. And people say, well, what's that? Okay. Well, let's say that you and I were sitting across from each other and you had water coming out of your eyes. I might look at you and say, why are you crying? But I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Glebel, the Martian who has just been assigned to go and examine humanity, gets out of his space capsule, toddles over to you with great delight and goes, why is there water coming from your eyes? And he might get a better answer because maybe you have allergies or maybe your contact lenses are bugging you or maybe there's an emotional basis because he didn't do any prejudging. He was open to all answers. And the story for that one that I always tell, there was a man who was married with a wife and a kid. He was in a terrible car accident. They put him back together, but his face was kind of spin art. Mm. Very embarrassed by how he looked, always hid. But he was still married with a kid. One day he was putting his daughter to bed and she grabs his face and she smushes it next to hers. And she says, this would be a great picture, but it would be better if mommy's face were in the picture. Old him would have thought, oh, my God, even my daughter thinks I'm horrible. PTSD for the rest of his life. Knew him, knew, be the Martian detective. Why would it be better if mommy's face were in the picture? And she goes, because mommy doesn't take good pictures and you do. (laughs) There you go. I love it. (laughs) So because he asked, he was able to sidestep PTSD and cement the fact that his daughter just still saw him as who he is. Really good. Wonderful. Cuts out all that noise in your head. It really does. It does. It, it, it also very nicely illustrates the difference in my mind between judgmentalism and discerning. Mm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Wanting to, right. just, wanting to discern, that's trying to make sense out of this polarity world that we live in. Yes. Judging includes, it goes beyond I'm that. I'm right it, and you're wrong. It includes yeah. right and wrong, includes morality, includes you know bad and good, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And, and the uh, most perplexing thing to me for the longest time, it took me a while to really learn how that concept works. 
Mm-hmm. And the, the reason that why is that I was so perplexed with why is it we have to spend so much time on the, the right and wrong, the good and bad. I didn't get that. Yeah. It didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. I did it because that's what I was taught to do. I just yep. didn't, I didn't know why. I still haven't figured out why. If you can, if you can tell me why, I'd like to know because I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> because you can choose whether to do it or not. I guess, yeah. You know, it's why if you were going into a Russian lit class, they would expect you to read the book. You couldn't go up to the professor and say, I know you've read the book. Why don't you just give me all the cliff notes? <laughs> That'll be fine. No, 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 no. Yeah, we're always looking for the cliff notes too, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not happening, baby. You know, not in life for you. <laughs> well, if you're lucky. I mean, there, there are going to be some people who will try to give you cliff notes, right? And for that, you can say, thank you for sharing. You may think that if you wish, and then you go do your life. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Very good. I like that. This is really an interesting um, exploration. I, I wasn't sure how this was going to go because it's always different. Everybody who comes in with psychic abilities always has their own, oh, know, well, their own taste, their own flavor. I, so. I have done almost 400 podcasts over the last 10 years. I can talk about how mashed potato recipes are part of your karma. I mean, this is easy. But it's why <laughs> I have done stand-up comedy. You think a psychic's life is easy. Because when the psychic doesn't believe their own press, then that means their ego is out of the way. They don't have anything to prove to you. It's, you know, I've had people come up to me at psychic fairs and say, tell me something you could know about me. And if you have a, if you're right, I'll have a reading with you. And I smile and I say, I'm sorry. I don't roll over and catch either. And I turn my back and they do not get a reading. Ooh. Ooh. And, you know, I, when I'm trying to grab lunch, I take like 15 minutes every two hours. There was a guy who leaned over my table, poked my sandwich with his hand and said, you don't need to eat right now. My wife wants a reading. Luckily, my front person slid in front, shoot him away from the booth. And needless to say, they never got in. But most psychics are treated like we're a burger or a car wash or a latte. One of the reasons I feel so different to so many people is because it's not just about the wiki woo service. I'm here to teach. I am here with, you know, so many different tools, general practitioner. And because I am not one of those psychics who thinks my aura don't stink. (laughs) So I come across as just a person. Most of the time, people's shields drop when they're with me, especially when I get them to laugh. And I give them the information they need to make their life wonderful. If you came here and you were opening up a business, I would not flip three cards and say, wait until January and fire the second redhead. What? It would be a card for you, a card for any partners you had in the business, a card for the energy around the business, the brick and mortar location, how to market it, clients, competition, staff, finances, what you need to know and best possible outcome. Because readings from me empower you. I give you the information and then you take that rocket pack on your back and you go make your life. You know, we get in trouble because the Madam Hoo-Hahs and the Swami Swalandas that are the fake gypsies. You have a family curse. How many in your family? Four? You have dog? Fifty dollars every family member. Twenty-five for a dog. He's small. We fix. I watched this in Canada 20 years ago. And the woman convinced the person who was sitting with her if she didn't burn 400 specially blessed candles in the Roman Catholic Church. I bless real good. Only one dollar candle. Her entire family was going to die in a car accident in two weeks. She bought it. Lovely. Wow. So, right. That's why I'm the kind of psychic I am. That's why I wrote my book, The Psychic Yellow Brick Road, How to Find the Real Wizards and Avoid the Flying Monkeys. I love the title. Ooh, yeah. There are six million books out there on psychic development. This teaches you how to stay safe, how to choose a psychic, how to use the information, when to run what we can't do and what you shouldn't ask. And there is no other book out there like it. None. Very interesting. You also mentioned that we all have these abilities. Other people have mentioned the Mm -hmm. same thing. From your Mm -hmm. perspective, if someone wants to just start developing their own abilities, where should they start? Same place I did. Opening to Channel by Sanaya Roman and Dwayne Packer. 
This book has been around for decades and decades. It taught me how to ground, center, shield, what was correct information, what wasn't, step by step, how to reach upstairs and be safe. So, you know, one of the marks of a true professional is when we know we are not your best source. For instance, I tell people about that book when they want in-depth health information. I'm like your GP, but I would send you to my buddy, Stacy Wells, whom I consider the best medical intuitive in the United States. Hmm. On the other hand, when you want tarot, when you want to know about your past lives, that's my wheelhouse. And I will hmm. be more than happy to work that with you. Hmm. Okay. So refer to the strengths. Yes. And if you truly want the best for your client, if you aren't the best, you will recommend the best to them. That's called being a professional. No matter what business you're in, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a great um, point. Uh, points makes it sound trivial, but it, it, it's not trivial. It, it, it's a great marker, perhaps, that people, I think, need to take on board, they, particularly mm-hmm. people who are entrepreneurial and already have a business going. There's, yes. there's, there's this strong tendency to feel like I need every potential business that comes my way to be in my business. And it's really counterproductive. It It is um, because people won't trust you and you won't trust yourself and you're going to be in your ego. Can I get through this? Can I figure mm. it out? Can I make them spend the money? Yeah. Not uh, worth that, it, guys. That, well, that just leads to misery. It does. I mean, it it, it's, it's, it's not a happy place to be because you're constantly chasing after something that isn't really you. It isn't really your right. client. It isn't really right. any of the things that, that got you into it in the first place. It's just, wow, is that going to turn into a dollar sign? And that's all that there is to it. And, it, and it's really, really thin at that point. And that's what gives psychics their worst reputation for people that think they're only in it for the money. We're here in service. That's why we do what we do, if we're doing it right. Really good stuff. Hey, we are beginning to uh, run a little short on time. First and foremost, there's there could be somebody out there saying, you know, this Corby woman, she may actually be the person I need to talk to. So she's got, they got to have some way to reach out. They got to find you. How do they find you? Let's let's start. Well, that. as you can see, um, if you're seeing, um, my website is my name, CorbyMitlai.com. Mm-hmm. You can find me on Facebook, Patreon, YouTube, uh, Medium, Instagram. All of it is under Corby Midlight. All right. And talk a little bit about, uh, well, you, you mentioned your book. Um, is it just the one book? Do you have other books? I'm not sure what you're. What I have three. Got. You have three. Clean okay. Out Your Life Closet is actually self help, clarity, adaptability, simplicity, and making friends with stress. The Psychic Elaborate Road is how to keep yourself safe when you're looking for psychic guidance. And if you're nuts enough to want to be part of this business like me, the book, You've Got the Magic Who Needs a Genie is everything I learned from being on the road 18 years, 45 weekends a year. My nickname was the Travel Channel. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, guys. I wrote it all down for you. The Travel Channel. Okay. Yeah, there's got to be a story associated with that one. I mean, just, just the nickname alone. I traveled a lot and I'm a channel. That's where it came from. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I get the feeling there's more to it than that. I mean, yeah, I get that. I, I got the analogy, but just, just the fact that that came together that way, the Oh, the travel channel. Yeah. That, that was my name given to me by the wonderful medium, Ali Cheslick, who passed on about five years ago, but is still talking to us. And we call her Chatty Kathy of the Dead. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Chatty Kathy of the Dead. Oh, is, is, that, is that really true that, that, uh, that there are certain elements of personality that get retained so that when you're when you're communicating with with someone on the other side, you, you I, I gather it's just sure. Your Remember what process. I said about my father. There's all the yeah, good okay. things are there. Yes, and you know I joke about the fact that I'll be in this business until I'm two weeks dead, and after that I'll be your spirit guide. I'll just change uniforms. <laughs> That's very good. I love that. All right, Sam, do you have anything more for uh, Corby before we wrap things up a little bit here? Not at this point, but this has been fascinating, and I appreciate hearing all of this. I find you fascinating, and I'll definitely be following you. Thank you. Thank you. I had a great time. Yeah, me too. Something I also want to tell you that I make it a point to tell all my guests 
um, because this is not something we hear very often, but I think we need to hear it. All, all people who are, uh, in, in your words, in service, in one way or another, reach out and touch people that they'll never meet, they'll never see, because they do podcasts and they write articles and they write books and so forth, and other people consume the material. And in many cases, it's just something that they said helps somebody in a way they don't even know about. Mm-hmm. And yet all of those connections like that, all of those touches, if you will, play immensely important roles, I think, in people's lives. And we don't, we don't recognize it enough. So on behalf of the people you have touched over the years, whom you've never met, you've never seen, but you've helped them in some way, thank you. Thank you on their behalf for all the things that thank you've you. done and for all the thank things you're you. continuing to, done, to, to, to do rather, um, in, in now and in the years to come. On their behalf, thank you very much. Appreciate you very much. Sam, I appreciate you too. Yeah, likewise. Keep us, keep us uh, apprised of what's going on with the album too. I mean, I'm oh, yes. really curious to know. For sure, for sure. Not not a lot lately, but if nothing else, I intend to keep creating. So, Well, definitely want to keep doing that. Don't stop at the one because you right, have so okay. much to come out of your fingers. Should be just, just, just only the beginning. Excellent. Love that. Very good. All right. So thank you guys very much. Thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.